So in this video, I'm going to actually go through an example using the geometric approach for finding the frequency response. And I will look at both the magnitude and the phase. Uh, depending on how long this takes, this might get cut into two separate videos. Now we're ready to do the phase. So we use a similar setup. We pick uh, a couple of test frequencies. Again, I'm just going to pick three test frequencies. We find uh, the phases associated with the vectors at those frequencies. Then we use the properties for the phase of the frequency response, where essentially we take the phases associated with the zeros, we add them all together, and then we subtract the phases associated with the poles. I'm going to make a very similar table to the one we did for the magnitude. I should actually label this up here and say we did magnitude. For the second part, we're doing the phase. I'm going to use the same test phases of 0, 2, and then the limit as omega tends to infinity. Uh, we have the phase of our zero vector. We have the phase of pole vector one. We have the phase of pole vector two. And then we have the overall phase of h of omega. So let's go one, one frequency at a time. For frequency equal to zero, this is uh, as we have it drawn here, the phase Phases are measured with respect to a line that's parallel to the real s-axis. So here we have a vector that's pointing to the right. So that would be in the same direction as the, re as the increasing real s-axis. And since we're on the real s-axis, it's really easy to see that the frequency associated with this vector is just going to be equal to zero. So that's already done. For the pole vectors, I'm just going to draw to make the notation a bit clearer here, at least for frequency zero. That I hear for each of these poles, I drew a line that's parallel to the real x-axis, and it is with respect to that line that we want to measure these angles. So the angle is being measured there. This angle is being measured there. So you can treat it as, okay, we have a, a line that's along the positive, a line that's parallel to the real s-axis, and then we're measuring the angle from that line. So again, for the zero vector, we have a phase of zero. For pull vector one, this one is going to be a negative angle because we're, we're going down from the, the line that points in the positive real direction. Because this is a length two, this is length two, this is actually a 45 degree angle. Uh, we're working with radians here. You could work with degrees. Uh, that's That can be up to you for the particular problem. Here we'll work with radians. So since the whole 90 degrees would be pi over two, 45 degrees would be pi over four. So the phase associated with pole vector one is going to be negative pi over four. And then by symmetry, the phase associated with this vector is going to be positive pi over 4. Okay, for the overall phase then, at this frequency of 0, we take the 0 vector phases. Here we just have 1, 0. And then we subtract the sum of the pole vector phases. So we're subtracting minus pi over 4 plus pi over 4. So these cancel each other out at this frequency. So we end up with an overall uh, phase of 0 radians. For the omega equal to 2, now we have all of our vectors pointing um, up here to omega equal to 2. I should probably label this a bit better. There we go. This is minus 2, plus 1, minus 2. Uh, we all picture now the vectors all pointing up here. Our zero vector will have a positive value that's between 0 and pi over 2. If you were to apply um, say a tangent, you could work out that the angle associated then with the zero vector in radian form is going to be 1.326. You could find this as the arctan of 2 divided by 0 0.5. Or, yeah, you could take the magnitude that we calculated here and you could apply a sine or cosine relationship, however you want to do it. Uh, but we can measure this phase in radians uh, here using the arctan. 
as probably the simplest without having to, to calculate the magnitudes. For pull vector 1, this is going to be a vector that's now horizontal, so this one's going to have a phase of 0 associated with it. It's horizontal and the vector is pointing to the right. If we had a polar 0 over here to the right of the imaginary s-axis, um, at the frequency of consideration, instead of having phase 0, we would have a phase of 180 degrees or pi. For pull vector 2, here we can do an arctan of 4 over 2, and that works out to being in radians 1.11. And now for the overall phase, we take the phases of the zeros, subtract the phases of the poles. So here we get 1.326, subtract 1.11. That gets us about 0.219 uh, radians. And now for the limit, as the frequency goes off to infinity, now these are cases where all the vectors are pointing upward, and so essentially they all have a value of pi over 2. The overall phase then will be pi over 2 minus pi over 2 minus pi over 2. So that's going to be negative pi over 2. Now we can try to plot this. And I'm going to fit this plot in here to the corner, because why not? Um, it's going to be mostly negative. Again, we've only found this for a couple of frequencies, so the plots that we're drawing by hand are not going to be particularly accurate, but they're ones that you can come up with in a relatively short period of time. So here we're plotting the phase of our h of omega. We have frequency 0, frequency 2, which I will draw like this. So it turns out that between 0 and 2, the frequency uh, goes up uh, sorry, the phase goes up to a maximum and then comes back down. So I'm going to sketch that uh, somewhat like this. I'm going to want our data point 0 0.219. So we go up 0 0.219, then there's a point where we have to cross the 0 uh, value and then kind of decay asymptotically and then Somewhere down here, we'll put in minus pi over 2. So as the frequency gets arbitrarily large, uh, we will have the phase decrease to that value. So I'll just draw it like this. Draw here, that show that that's our data point. Um, and again, this is a very rough sketch. We've just found it for a couple of test frequencies. And if you want to do it for more frequencies, you could go ahead and do that. Um, if you were to work directly with the complex numbers, you can come up with an actual equation for what the uh, phase should look like for any arbitrary angle. So I'll show that on screen now so you can compare that with uh, the work that's involved with doing this geometric approach. I find the geometric approach is good for getting intuition about how these actually look. When you start looking particularly at the magnitude plots, you get a sense of how the system will behave for inputs that have relatively low frequencies or relatively high frequencies. And that becomes really useful when starting to talk about filters. Once we deal with these examples, the next few videos will be talking about uh, filters in the analog uh, domain. This is really building up on the material that we've been covering the last several videos, talking about stability, talking about these frequency responses. Now we can start talking about filters as kind of an application of, of all this math that we're seeing here. But anyway, that's it for this example. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you liked it. You can leave any feedback in the comments. And if you're interested in catching more of this series on signal processing, you can also subscribe. Okay, see you next time.